my name is Heidi Walliger and I am a nursery and greenhouse extension educator with Michigan State University. Today's webinar will cover plant nutrition and fertilization. This presentation was recorded in front of a live audience and has been optimized for your viewing online. Please note that this MSU Extension program is open to all. If you need any additional accommodations, please contact me at my email at the bottom of the screen. Now I would like to introduce Dr. Bert Craig, Associate Professor of Horticulture and Forestry at Michigan State University. When it comes to nutrition, um, dealing with plants either in the field or in the container, and I'll talk, try and talk a bit about both, and obviously there's big differences and we'll highlight those whenever we can, but you know a lot of our focus tends to be on nitrogen because it's the biggest uh, you know, the nutrient we use in the biggest amounts, it really drives a lot of our fertilization programs and fertilization decisions, but, you know, there's more to nutrition than just nitrogen. And so I thought a, a good topic for a talk would be to talk about some of the elements, other elements that we maybe don't think about as much, um, and, you know, how those can impact uh, growth and productivity of our, of our crops. Um, just want to highlight a couple things real quick. Uh, a lot of information I'll be presenting today, <clears throat> pulled, up, pulled from a variety of sources, but relied a lot on uh, a series of articles that Tom Landis and Kaz Dumrose have put together. And if you don't already visit or have bookmarked or whatever you do, the uh, U.S. Forest Service uh, Reforestation Nursery and Genetics Resources, the ringer.net, and just Google ringer.net, it'll take you right to this page. Um, actually, a page before this one, but, <clears throat> and that is a great resource. And they have a lot of information. The uh, container nursery manuals that many of you have, the whatever, seven or eight volume, the complete set of those is there's PDFs. You can download them or just print out the pages you want or just go back, you know, save them and refer back to them. And then they still produce twice a year the forest nursery notes. And um, again, it's geared towards you know forest trees, conifers, things like that. But there's a lot of general horticultural information. If you go in the back, they have um, all various research articles, and a lot of it's drawn from horticultural sources. There's a lot of things out of hort science, hort technology, things that apply to ornamental crops as well. So if you're not using those. I uh, strongly encourage you to, to visit that site and you'll find a lot of useful information. One of the things they did um, over the course of several years was to put together a series of articles on all the various nutrient elements. Okay? And so that's kind of what I'm, what I'm doing here today. And so I, I borrow pretty freely from a lot of the information they have there because it's a good one-stop shop for a lot of this, a lot of this uh, information. So again, you can sign up. They still put out a hard copy. You can get the forest nursery notes. and um, you know, there's, they usually have individual topics that they'll go in depth. This is one recently where they looked at lighting, so supplemental lighting for uh, nurseries, uh, light quality, all that stuff. Uh, very, very well done. They do a lot of, uh, you know, things from the scientific literature, so it's well done. So we've been talking about, uh, you know, pest management, and obviously that's always an immediate and urgent concern for growers, uh, but we can't forget about, uh, mineral nutrition either. So just like for all of us, we need to have uh, you know, our, our vitamins and minerals, uh, plants, plants do as well. So it's important not to forget about that uh, because oftentimes these may not be the immediate problem but uh, are going to be some, some chronic issues that we're going to have to deal with. So what I'd like to do in the next uh, 45 minutes or so is to talk about uh, the essential elements. You probably have all have had these at some point but we'll kind of review some of those. Uh, visit a concept known as, known as the law of the minimum and how that applies to plant nutrition. And then we'll kind of go through all the elements, but I'm going to really highlight those that typically are going to be limiting for, for us in uh, nursery production. Um, talk a bit about assessing nutrient status. Also, again, contrast a little bit of, of field production versus container production because we do have different issues in each of those. And then how we go about correcting nutrient problems. So some fertilization uh, ideas. And then one thing we really want to be concerned with these days is issues related to over-fertilization. So what we want to do is try to get the plant 
what it needs and no more, right, is what we're really after in trying to uh, develop our, our nutrition programs. So start off with some pretty basic stuff. Hopefully all of you have had this at some point. But we know that there are, depending on who's counting, uh, 17 elements that are essential for all plants. So whatever plant you're talking about, they all need, all need these uh, 17 elements. Um, nickel is kind of the newcomer to the list. Back when I was in college, we learned there were 16 elements. So it's, it's evolving. Some of these are fairly, uh, you know, we're still understanding the role of some of these, some of these things in plant nutrition. Uh, the big ones, so macros, we refer to macronutrients because of the amounts they're needed in. Okay, not because they're large molecules. I've heard people say that, no. Okay, not, that nothing to do with the size of the molecule, but the ones that are needed in the greatest quantities. And we'll talk about you know, what those quantities are here in just a little bit. And then we have uh, what are referred to as micronutrients. Those are elements that are needed in relatively small amounts. Okay, things like iron, boron, manganese, copper, zinc. Those are things that are needed in, in relatively uh, small amounts. Okay. A few concepts to remember as we're going through this. Nutrient elements are not taken up in their elemental form. So we have nitrogen, right? 70-some percent of the air around us is nitrogen, N2. Okay. Plants can't utilize that form of nitrogen, right? They can't just take nitrogen out of the atmosphere. It has to be in what we call an ionic form. It has to be in a charged form. In the case of nitrogen, that would be either nitrate or ammonium. It's actually the one element that occurs is both an anion, a negatively charged, and a positively charged. Okay? Most of the other elements are going to be one or the other. So we have things like phosphate, okay, sulfate. Okay, those are going to be anions that will be taken up by the plant roots. Okay, and all these things will be taken up out of solution in the soil. All right? And then we have cations, okay, things like calcium, potassium, magnesium, a lot of the metal elements, iron, copper, zinc, Okay, those are all going to occur as cations or positively charged ions in the soil. Why is that important? Well, because what holds on to those positively charged ions in the soil gives us what we call our cation exchange capacity. So cation exchange capacity is going to be dependent on the amount of clay particles. So you see this clay here and the little negatively charged symbols around it. So that is a negatively charged uh, particle in the soil, so it's going to hang on to the positives, the opposites attract, and so the clay is going to hang on to our uh, cations, as is our organic matter. So one of the ways that we can help to improve our can exchange capacity, okay, it's not practical to go out and start dumping a bunch of clay and try to till that in the soil, plus you just end up with concrete anyway. Um, so what, but what we can do is we can increase organic matter, and that improves our soil as a reservoir for holding on to some of these nutrients. And as we try to manage some of these elements, okay, especially these cations, potassium, for example, understanding our cation exchange capacity is going to be important in how we, in how we manage that. An important concept in dealing with plant nutrition is something that's sometimes referred to as the law of the minimum, or Liebig's law of the minimum, was a German physiologist. And the notion here is that the amount of growth or productivity we can get out of, a, out of a plant is ultimately dependent on the most limiting resource. Okay? And so the analogy that's often used is depicted here is this thing of the sort of the staves in a barrel. Right? So you can only fill the barrel up as far as the lowest stave of that, of that barrel. So in this case, they're showing it here as being water as the primary limiting factor. Now, if we irrigate and we remove the water limitation, maybe make that up here somewhere, well, now what's going to be the next limiting factor? Well, in the example here, it looks like nitrogen. So you can only go as far as that one limiting element. Okay, so if we can identify what that is, okay, then we can help to increase the productivity of, of our crop. All right, so that's an important thing to think about because we have all these different elements. Okay, and what's an essential element? Well, essential element is something the plant needs in order to fulfill all its physiological processes, grow and develop. So if any of those, in theory at least, if any of those 16 elements or 17 elements are limiting, okay, they could be the factor that's, that's limiting growth. And they don't always have a, uh, you know, don't always raise their hand to tell us which one they are. So it can take a little bit of, little bit of uh, detective work. So what elements are likely to be limiting? Not all of them are. Uh, even though we have you know, that whole long list, there's some that typically are not going to be limiting. 
which ones are going to be limiting are going to depend on several factors, like everything in, in life and in nursery management. The answer is it depends. One of the important things that's going to depend on is the production system. And mainly what I'm thinking of here is field versus container production. In field production, most but not all of our micronutrients are usually present in our soil. Okay, now we have some exceptions, especially over here when we get on the west side of the state. Those of you that have seedling nurseries or are working near the lake shore, I know we have some nurseries that are basically in like blow sand. Okay, you're almost in a soilless culture at that point. Right? You, don't have, you don't have a lot of CEC, you don't have a lot of kind of exchange capacity. And so those nurseries are going to be almost, almost like managing a container nursery in the sense of you're dealing with a soilless, almost a soilless substrate. But for most of us that have, you know, loamy soils have some clay, by and large, and I'll, and I'll talk about a few limitations, most of our micronutrients are going to be there. Okay? Um, container production is a totally different matter, right? Because in container production, when we're dealing with soilless substrates, you're going to have to account for all of the nutrient elements in your fertilization program, either through fertigation or through controlled release product. You know, somehow or another, you're going to have to account for all those different elements, you know, molybdenum, copper, zinc, all those things are going to have to be in your, in your nutrient program where in the field you might not have to worry about. Now, typically copper, we don't see issues. Zinc, we don't see issues okay, in, our, in our field soils. Soil type, we've already alluded to this, the fact that you, if you have a sandy soil, okay, low cation exchange capacity, things like potassium, okay, magnesium, they could become limiting over time because there's not a lot of those negatively charged clay particles or organic matter to bind that in the soil, and so those elements tend to leach through. Okay, and you can lose them. The crop, we know that there are some problem children out there. Okay, certain plants that tend to have certain nutrient problems. Um, <clears throat> classic examples would be manganese deficiency in red maple. Okay, happens all the time. Uh, iron chlorosis in pin oak happens all the time. Um, there's one that's kind of a unique thing, a mouse ear in river birch. Okay, it's a nickel deficiency of all things, you know, who, who'd have thought? Uh, so we know that there can be certain plants that are going to be prone to these problems as well, so we have to keep an eye out, have to be keeping an eye out for, for those. Okay, I think I've kind of hit this already, but basically the notion is that, you know, and, and kind of be taking steps back and forth between the two of these, um, <clears throat> and again, except for those situations where you have these extremely sandy, low CEC types of soils, there's really an adequate reservoir of most elements to, to grow field-grown crops. Now, we can run into issues with availability, and we'll talk about pH and some of these factors, but as far as the nutrients being there, okay, they're, they're likely there. It's just a matter of, of making sure we can make them available. The other thing is, of course, on the container side, now we're dealing with you know, pine bark, peat-based substrates, soil of substrates, so you're going to have to account for all those nutrients in your, in your fertilization program. And again, either through fertigation or controlled release or maybe a combination of the two in order to get, in order to get there. Okay. So let's talk about uh, some of this in a little bit more detail. Usually when we talk about these essential elements, okay, we start off, we say there's 16 or 17 essential elements. Well, we throw carbon, hydrogen, oxygen right out of the equation from the get-go because the plants are going to get those from air and water. Right? So we don't, don't really consider those as mineral. So we talk about mineral elements, we're talking about all the things down below here, okay, the things that aren't coming from, from air and water. So now we can talk about <clears throat> what are sometimes referred to as uh, macronutrients. Some people will talk about N, P, and K as primary nutrients, because those are the ones, okay, when we do a complete fertilizer, that's our main concern. And then they'll list Calcium, magnesium, and sulfur as secondary elements. Okay, they're still macronutrients, need in large amounts, but we don't tend to worry about them as much as N, P, and K. Okay, you'll see that. And then everything down below gets lumped in here together as our, as our micronutrients. <coughs> so let's start off. We'll talk about some of these micro or macronutrients. And, and as I said, we've, we've kind of deliberately in this discussion, we're going to kind of uh, set nitrogen aside, we've done, you know, talks on that separately here in, in other venues. Um, so we're really going to focus on the ones down below. So when we talk about uh, what makes a macronutrient or a micronutrient, 
A lot of it gets down to if you were to do a foliar analysis, okay, so you can send samples into a lab and get the percent dry weight. So we dry the tissue down, send it off to the lab, get it analyzed. What percent of that dry weight is made up of these different mineral elements, right? The bulk of it's going to be carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, you know, the carbohydrates and starches and cell wall structure and all that that's in a plant. But then you have the different amounts of the mineral nutrients in there. <clears throat> so when we look at macronutrients, typically when we get our results back from a, a lab, when they do the full analysis, macronutrients are going to come back in terms of percent dry weight. All right, so when you look at this and we look at uh, nitrogen, for example, an average tissue concentration, this would be for a conifer, I should point out. Uh, conifers will get about 1.5, maybe 2% dry weight of nitrogen, okay? Maybe 1% potassium, calcium, 0.5%, magnesium, phosphorus, about 0.2%, and sulfur, about 0.1%. Point being, they're actually expressed as a percent of the dry weight, okay? So, Using 90 plus, 93, 94 percent of the dry matter of a plant is going to be carbohydrates. Okay, all the cell wall material, all of that, and then you've got the the amount that's in here in the uh, in the mineral elements. Um, we can have different amounts depending on whether the plant's grown in a container or uh, bare root. They're showing the a lot of the container being lower. I'm not sure I'd buy that. I think oftentimes you're going to have higher levels in container, but it'll depend a little bit on the, on the management, the fertilization, as well as particular crops. Certain crops will accumulate more of certain elements. Okay. Um, a little ahead of the game here, but for example, we've done work in the past with um, sweet gum, in a, in a previous job I had, and sweet gum will accumulate 10 times as much manganese as similar crops or uh, trees grown in, in, under the same fertilization regime. What's it, doing all that, what's it doing with all that manganese? I don't know. You know it's just it's luxury consumption, just taking it up. Um, is that important? Probably not. But when you're looking at the test results, you need to understand that. So one of the things you want to do is, and we'll talk about this later, is to, uh, for your most important crops at least, develop a library, kind of a history of what your uh, foliar uh, nutrients look like. So you get a history over time of what these things ought to, ought to be looking like and recognize that different plants will have different sort of profiles, if you will, of their, of their nutrient concentrations. And I'll, I'll get back to that point a little bit later. Um, so let's kind of go through and let's talk about these. We say there's all these different nutrients. What are they doing in the plant and what happens when there's not enough there? Um, first one we'll talk about is phosphorus. And so phosphorus is a critical element in plant physiology, and hopefully somewhere along the line, <laughs> take you back to your high school or college biology here, but you'll remember things like the Krebs cycle and things like that, where you're seeing all these energy-rich compounds, ATPs, ADPs, running around. Well, the P's and all those things, and we're showing the energy bonds here, okay, those are all phosphorus molecules, right? And so we need phosphorus is critical for a lot of these energetic reactions, so both for respiration and photosynthesis, phosphorus is really a key element in a lot of those reactions. So one of the things we see when we don't have adequate phosphorus is decreased growth because we don't have enough energy okay, to make new tissues and to do all the things that we need to be doing in the plant. Um, phosphorus is also important in the genetics, so in RNA and DNA molecules, the function of the membranes, okay, so regulating water relations, all these things. Uh, phosphorus is also going to play a, a pivotal role. So it's one of the most important elements in terms of the overall physiology. Phosphorus in soils is pretty complex. Um, and again, the, the figure here might be a little bit small, but the thing, to, the thing to understand about phosphorus is there's a big difference between the total amount of phosphorus that, that's in the soil and what's available to plants. So a lot of phosphorus is going to be uh, tied up in various forms, what we call non-labile phosphorus. Okay, in fact, probably 99%, 98% of, of the phosphorus in the, in the soil may not be readily available to plants. So we have the phosphorus that's in solution, so the sort of center circle here okay, is, is what can be taken up by the plant roots. Remember, plants are taking up nutrients from the soil solution by their roots 
Okay, so the amount of P in the soil that's in that solution P is really going to be fairly small. Okay, and that's going to be affected by several things, the overall phosphorus that's, that's there, as well as things like soil pH okay, are going to impact, are going to impact that. And so that's an important factor to remember when you're looking at, at phosphorus relationships, just because there's a lot there than the same that's available to the plant. For container production, it's a little bit different story because we're supplying the P from our fertilizer. That's going to be in the solution, okay, and so it's going to be really taken up. So phosphorus problems typically are going to be more of an issue when you're dealing with a field situation due to low availability than it would necessarily be in for a, a, container, a container production. Oh, so, so the question was Mike was saying, well, when I get my soil test, it comes back, I've got tons of phosphorus, but you have this sort of sneaking suspicion in the back of your mind, if I added some, I might get a response. And probably the thing to do is to just do some trialing. I think really is, is probably the, the answer to that. Um, you know, and you might convince yourself, no, it's not going to help me. Um, so that would be the, the answer to that, because really you don't know. And I'll, I'll talk about that here in a second, is really the only way to judge a phosphorus response typically is to do some trialing um, because you can't always, can always tell. We can look at some foliar levels. And again, the, the rub we have and what makes things such a challenge with nursery production is people are growing dozens, hundreds of species and cultivars and everything's got a little different response. You're going to get a different thing out of hydrangea than you'll get out of wygelia than you'll get out of conifers. And so all these things have different responses. Well, if you start doing foliar testing on all these things, it, it can add up in a hurry, but, but unfortunately that's, that's probably the best, the best answer we can give. We can get occasionally, and, and this is another, <laughs> I'll get on my soapbox here again. Another thing that, and I'm, and I'm a little guilty of it right here, another thing that we get into is you'll pick up, and there was a, an issue of nursery management, or not nursery, uh, American nurserymen, uh, I don't know, a year or two ago, and there was an article about diagnosing nutrient deficiencies. And, you know, if you just match the symptom to the, to the you know, match up the symptom to the deficiency, you can diagnose your nutrient deficiencies, okay? I don't know about that. I've, it's never worked that well for me. Um, and that's it, because you can have lots of deficiencies that can show similar symptoms, um, some deficiencies that won't show symptoms. And so this notion that you can thumb through a color bulletin or you can thumb through something online and just find the deficiency that match what you're seeing in the field is going to diagnose your nutrient deficiency is it ain't going to happen. Um, now you can see some things that might lead you in that direction. One of the things we can sometimes see with phosphorus deficiency is a purpling. Uh, and this can happen, not only this happens to be a grape leaf here, um, but for um, this is a maple. Hopefully it's, it's a little washed out, but hopefully you can, you can pick up on some of these leaves here where you're picking up a little bit of purpling on that. This can also happen with conifers as well. It's a little bit of purpling on the needles, but you don't always see that. So one of the things you want to do, and Mike, I think probably the, the solution in your case is to actually do some trialing, and that's what they've done here, is looking at different amounts of phosphorus in their uh, mix. This was container-grown seedlings and then matching up the shoot concentration of phosphorus with the actual growth response. So really, till you see the growth response, you know, may be difficult, it may be difficult to tell. And even if you have the foliar, uh, foliar P, you know, for one plant, what may be adequate might be inadequate for another. Okay, so that's always one of the, the dilemmas we have to deal with with do, dealing with so many crops. If you're a forestry nursery and you're growing five species, well, yeah, you can afford to invest a lot of time and effort into, you know, foliar testing for all these, for, you know, for your, for your crops. Uh, when you're dealing with, you know, dozens and hundreds of, of species and cultivars, it gets a little bit more of a, a little more of a challenge. Another thing to pay attention to, as we mentioned with phosphorus, is that uh, P availability is going to depend on uh, soil pH. So you've all heard that Again, for field soils, our optimum pH is around 6.5, right, just to the acidic side of neutral. Why is that? Well, because some elements tend to increase in their availability with, with pH, and a lot of things tend to decrease in their availability with pH. And so there's sort of the sweet spot right around 6.5, and, and for some crops it can be a little lower. But in terms of availability of our nutrients, 
you know, to the acidic side of neutral is usually going to be going to be optimum. And the problem with phosphorus is you have different uh, forms where it's tied up depending on if the pH is getting too high or getting too low. Main point being that, you know, having your pH down around that 6.5 or maybe even slightly lower range is going to be going to be um, optimum. Okay. Another thing to be aware of when you're looking at uh, soil tests and you're dealing with phosphorus is that um, different parts of the country, because of this uh, effect of pH primarily, different parts of the country use different extraction methods. So one of the things you want to do with uh, soil testing in particular is to try and develop a relationship with a, with a particular lab, and especially a particular lab in your part of the country. Um, I know some folks use the MSU lab, some folks use a &L down in um, Indiana, uh, but develop a relationship with that lab, uh, one, so that if you ever do have a problem, you can go back and say, hey, this came off you know, a little high, what, what do you think is going on? And you guys can work that back and forth. Uh, but the other thing is that different parts of the country use different extraction techniques, and it will affect, uh, in fact, can affect fairly dramatically the reading that you get. Most of the Midwest here use what's called the Bray extraction. I won't go into all the details of that, but just recognize that you know you want to understand what extraction they're using, and that can impact the results you get and also the interpretation. Most labs now, when you send the samples back, or when you send the samples off them, you're going to get back you know, these generated reports, and they'll tell you what's adequate, inadequate, usually even give you some uh, fertilization recommendations to go along with it. So, again, working with a given lab, you can, you can tailor your, your program. Maybe your crop needs a little lower pH. If you're dealing with conifers, you might want your pH down at 6 instead of 6.5. Okay, they can adjust their liming recommendations, all those things based on, based on uh, what, what you've asked for. This was some information from Cornell University a while back uh, that talks about uh, based on, you know, what your P levels come back as, okay, and obviously yours are off the scale here, but, um, you know, what kind of, of recommendation for phosphorus you're going to get, actual P205, and then using either uh, phosphate or uh, triple superphosphate, um, how much material you need to you need to apply to get to those get to those levels. Lots of different sources of phosphorus. Probably the most common are going to be uh, superphosphate, uh, triple superphosphate. Um, if you also need uh, nitrogen, of course, then you can go with DAP or something like that. Uh, again, if you work with your uh, soil testing lab and your co-op, you can probably develop a blend that's going to uh, be able to match the the test result with what you need to be what you need to be uh, applying. Switching gears a little bit, talk about uh, potassium. Now, one thing I didn't mention with with phosphorus, phosphorus occurs when the elements actually occurs as an anion, as a negatively charged. Most of the nutrients that we deal with occur as uh, cations. So, in this case, what we're looking at kind of a, a complex chart here. But again. The, the oval or circle there towards the center is the soil solution. That's what the plants are going to take up. Okay. Potassium cations, K, K plus cations is what the plant's going to take up. Okay. Where is it getting those? Well, it's going to get those off of organic matter in the soil. The organic matter tends to have a negative charge, contributes to the cation exchange capacity. And then you can also have uh, potassium that's bound to or ad, adsorbed, not absorbed, but adsorbed to the surface of clay particles, and those are those K's you see around these uh, clay particles. So clay particles are usually depicted as these sort of platy structures there in the soil, and uh, it's from those that the uh, plant can take, up, can take up the potassium. If you have a very sandy soil, and we do have some sandy soils here in, in Michigan, you have very few of those clay particles in there, and what happens is those potassium molecules, those K plus charges have nothing to adsorb to, and with the irrigation and rain, they simply get leached through the soil over time. That's why if you're dealing with those soils, you've got to pay particular attention to some of these cations and how you manage those to keep the, an adequate uh, reservoir for your, for your plants. 
Physiologically, what's potassium doing? Well, potassium is involved primarily in plant water relations. So most of you are aware of the fact that uh, we have stomata on the underside of the leaves, the pores that are regulating water loss. Okay, they open, they allow water to transpire out through the leaf, but they also allow CO2 to enter the leaf. Okay, and so um, the regulation, how do plants open and close the stomata? Well, part of that is involved with moving potassium around okay, in and out of those guard cells. And so having an adequate amount of phosphorus is very important for plant water relations and, and drought tolerance in particular. Uh, we hear a lot of stuff about potassium and cold hardiness. Um, and really, when you look at the literature, it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, Harold Pellet at the University of Minnesota did some studies years ago, actually compiled a series of studies years ago, and showed that, by and large, potassium fertilization did improve cold hardiness in uh, ornamental plants. But there are occasionally we do see studies where, no, it looks like other elements are probably more important. The bottom line is we, we tend to rely a lot on um, muriate of potash, KCL, for our uh, potassium fertilization. And a lot of times it's good to apply uh, that in the fall anyway, because what we want to do is we want to get uh, the potassium in the plant, but we don't want all the chloride. And so by fertilizing with potassium chloride in the fall, um, it, may, it may help us with our cold hardiness. Winter like this, it may not matter. Um, but the other thing it does is by having that applied in the fall, you've got the winter uh, snow melt and spring rains to help dissipate some of the chloride from that, from that uh, fertilizer. Potassium, and again, we have to always, when we're trying to use visible symptoms as a diagnosis, it's one piece of the puzzle, right? It's, it's hard to diagnose a nutrient problem simply based on a, a foliar symptom. We want to combine it with some soil testing or foliar testing if we can. One of the things we will see with uh, potassium is a marginal necrosis. So we talk about deficiency symptoms. We talk about chlorosis being a yellowing. Necrosis would be a dead area. Okay, so in this case, what you're looking at is a marginal necrosis or this, this dead area. And what may be happening here with lack of potassium, again, remember it's involved with regulating the stomatal opening and closing, is if the plant's not able to do that adequately, you can actually have some areas of the plant that may be losing too much water and desiccating, okay, or they're not transpiring enough and we have some heat damage. So that's a typical type of, of symptom with uh, potassium. And again, just some, some ideas of rates here of what we might be looking at. Um, typically, when we're looking at applying uh, potassium uh, based on our, on our soil tests, the most common form of potassium we're going to be using will be uh, KCL, which is about 60% uh, potassium. One thing we need to be careful of in looking at potassium sources, especially potassium or uh, Myriad of potash, KCL, is that potassium chloride has a very high salt index. So you have a high potential for fertilizer burn. So you want to make sure that either you're applying this when plants are dormant, you're going to get some rain, or you can irrigate uh, afterwards to, to, get that, to get that in. So potassium chloride, um, occasionally people will use uh, potassium sulfate, but uh, for the most part, potassium chloride is our principal uh, at least for field production, at least, are going to be our principal source of, of uh, potassium. So some other elements we don't typically think of or, or rarely are limiting, but we'll just mention um, sulfur. Again, these are all essential elements. Uh, typically, we don't see uh, particular issues with uh, sulfur, at least in, in field production. Um, what is it doing in the plant? Well, when you look at the formation of proteins, okay, enzymes, all the things that, that plants put together, there's a set of what we call essential amino acids. And a couple of these essential amino acids contain sulfur. Okay, so we can't make proteins. We can't do all the things that the plants need to do without, without sulfur. Because of this, when you do have a sulfur deficiency, it can look a lot like nitrogen deficiency because that's the other thing that uh, other component of amino acids is going to be nitrogen. So sulfur deficiency and nitrogen deficiency can often look uh, similar, although in, in field soils we really have issues with 
uh, sulfur. Typically, when we're applying sulfur to plants, it's primarily as a means of acidifying the soil. So a lot of our situations, especially with conifers, okay, we have issues with our pH being too high, and so we apply sulfur to acidify the soil and bring our, bring our pH down. Magnesium, this is one that can be uh, limiting in certain cases. Um, the, the physiological function is pretty clear. When you look at the chlorophyll molecule itself, okay, right there in the center is a magnesium molecule. And so uh, one of the things we see when plants are deficient in magnesium is they can't make enough chlorophyll, and so they become chlorotic. So it's a pretty obvious, pretty obvious symptom. Um, magnesium can be a problem if pH gets too low. Okay, we can have other issues when pH gets too low as well, but one of them is... Uh, is uh, magnesium deficiency. Um, if we do have to adjust our pH upward, and it happens sometimes, we have to lime to raise pH. If you can use dolomitic limestone, that's often preferred because that's going to add both calcium and magnesium okay, in roughly equal proportions that, uh, that, the, plants, that the plants are going to need. Uh, typical things we can see with a magnesium deficiency and it's not unique to, to magnesium, other things that can cause this, but is intervenal chlorosis. So hopefully you can see here the, the veins stay dark green, but then you get this yellowing or chlorosis in the intervenal area. So intervenal chlorosis is a typical thing with magnesium. The other thing we can get if we're dealing with conifers is you get the chlorosis, but instead here you get it out the tips. Hopefully you can all, you can all see that. So... That's not the only thing that could cause that, but one of the things you might want to pursue if you're seeing those symptoms would be looking at, you know, what's phosphorus in my soil, what's phosphorus in my plants, and see if that's, see if that's uh, going to lead you in that, in that direction. All right, so um, switching over to um, micros then. So again, remember we said before that when we're looking at foliar tissue with our uh, macronutrients, we're going to be talking about things that are occurring in percent dry weight. When we talk about uh, micronutrients, we're talking about things that if you get a foliar test run and get the results back, they're going to come back in parts per million. So when you look at this, these uh, right two columns here, if you look at something like iron, 5 to 10 parts per million. Manganese, okay, remember I said before, there are certain plants, I give the example of sweet gum, that can accumulate a lot of manganese. We don't necessarily know why, but they do. And so here you've got a range from a 100, or 100 to 5,000, okay? But all these are in parchment, and some are, you know, truly trace amounts. So copper, the amount of copper you might come back as five parts per million, okay, is the amount of copper in your, in your leaf tissue. Molybdenum might be a fraction of a, of a part per million. It's actually talking about parts per billion now in terms of the amount that's there. It's, it's essential, it's there, it's needed, but it's just needed in these very trace amounts. And in most field soils, again, unless you're dealing with an extremely low uh, CEC sandy site, most of these things will, will be there. The biggest issues we tend to run into with uh, field soils is going to be availability due to, due to uh, soil pH issues. First of all, talk about uh, iron. Iron is involved in chlorophyll synthesis. We said before magnesium was important because it's part of the chlorophyll molecule itself. Iron isn't actually part of the chlorophyll molecule, but it's involved in the reactions of chlorophyll synthesis. Okay, so if you don't have iron, you still end up with chlorosis. Okay, and uh, what they're showing here, this is a, an example, some pine seedlings that were iron deficient. Um, the classic example with iron deficiency, especially in landscapes, but in nurseries as well, is pin oak. It's a species that's uh, what we call an iron inefficient plant. So some plants are not very efficient at taking up iron. Pin oak is one of those, and the, the underlying problem here typically is going to be pH. There's probably iron there. Um, I used to live in Oklahoma. Okay, they got red soil. Why is the soil red in Oklahoma? Because it's loaded with iron. Okay, but yet if you try to grow pin oak there, it's going to be, you know, yellow as a as a legal pad. And the reason is because of soil pH. And so what we're showing here, this is looking at. Uh, for, in this case, a container mix. This is from some work on Oregon State that Jim Outland did. But he's looking at the availability of iron from a, from a soilless mix. Okay. And so as the substrate pH is increasing here from whatever, 4 to 8 to 9, 
Okay, you can see the availability of that iron okay, decreasing along the, the axis there. And so one of the things you have to watch if in both field production and container production is your substrate or your soil pH because as that increases above, uh, in the case of <clears throat> feed soil, it's probably above about 6 or so, 6 to 5 on up. You can start to get into some uh, pH-induced problems with iron. For uh, container substrates, we usually bump that down about a pH unit. So if 6.5 is your optimum for a particular crop in the field, 5.5 five is probably your target for a container. Basically, options for adding uh, iron, uh, a lot of people use iron chelates available. So what a chelate is, basically it's a larger molecule that sort of encapsulates the iron molecule and then releases it so it's available to the plant. Um, we also have ferrous sulfate, another material that we can use for uh, addressing our, our iron uh, issues. So there's a couple options in, in dealing with that. Um, another uh, pH-related issue that we often see is manganese. And this is a very common one with uh, red maple in particular. Uh, also with conifers, we can see this uh, as, and here you're looking at the, <clears throat> this is foliar, this is tissue concentration of manganese here, and I've, I've forgotten the crop, I think this was one of their conifers. Uh, but you look at the manganese concentration of the tissue versus pH, and you see that very steep decline as pH increases, uh, you're getting a drop in the uh, manganese uptake. Again, it's, it's a nutrients there in very, very small amounts, but it's important particularly for some of the light harvesting reactions of photosynthesis. You probably learned about light reactions, dark reactions of photosynthesis back in the day. And some of the initial steps in capturing light energy in photosynthesis is dependent on the presence of manganese. So as we get decreases in manganese, we can have de decreases in uh, photosynthetic efficiency and reductions in, in uh, growth and productivity. And you can also get very strong chlorosis. This is an example of some uh, Freemani maples, um, again, we mentioned red maple, but Freemani's, we'll, we'll see it as well. These are trees grown in the same nursery under the same uh, fertilization regime, okay, probably growing from, you know, distance one side of this room to the other, maybe not even that far apart. Um, same cultivar, same fertilization, everything the same. The only difference was the soil pH. Okay, we're looking at about a half, a half a unit of pH difference here going from maybe a 6.2 on the left to maybe 6.7 on the right. Remember, pH is an exponential scale. Okay, so a pH of 6 is 10 times as acidic as a pH of 7. pH of 5 is 100 times as acidic as 7. And so small differences in pH can make big differences in nutrient availability. In this case, it's uh, manganese. And I'll just kind of move on here. Um, Occasionally, you can, you can address the manganese deficiency by applying uh, manganese either in part of a multi-mix, you know, micro-max or something like that, <clears throat> or you can add manganese. Usually, our, the better approach is to try to adjust the pH problem. Okay, if we can add sulfur, uh, fertilize with ammonium sulfate, something like that to try to drive the pH down uh, is, is probably a better, better approach. Um, other micros that we can sometimes see issues with, and I wouldn't say commonly, but occasionally can see problems with in, in the field, is boron. So boron is involved in, in various plant functions, particularly related to uh, growth. And so uh, there are examples of boron deficiency, particularly in agronomic crops. It's actually fairly common in, in a lot of agronomic crops. And in forest plantations, a lot of the when you start looking at the literature on boron and uh, particularly conifers, uh, a lot of the literature will pretty quickly steer you to uh, radiata pine, like in New Zealand and Australia. And they've had a lot of issues with boron over the years in those, in those situations. We will occasionally see boron uh, show up in nurseries. Um, one thing you want to be aware of is that with boron, uh, we didn't really talk about this, but I think you all are aware of the fact that dose makes the poison. 
right? And so if you look at, I don't have my graph up here, but typically when I give these talks, I show the graph of, you know, with most of these elements, you get increasing growth as the concentration increases, you level off, and you're here at your sort of optimum point, and then we have a range of luxury consumption, right? We can take, keep taking up the element, we don't get any more growth out of it, and then eventually, though, you can, you can fall off and you get toxicity. Boron is one where there's actually a fairly narrow range between sufficiency and, and toxicity. So you want to be a little careful. If you get a soil test or some analysis back that indicates you need to be fertilizing with boron, you know, a bit of a red flag and, and maybe look at splitting your application. Do half of the recommended rate, see how the plant responds, and then add the rest if you think you still need it. But uh, be careful with that because you can, you can run into some potentially run into some toxicity problems. Um, and this is the kind of thing they see in uh, these pine plantations with boron deficiency. Remember we said that boron is involved with the formation of these new tissues, of, of growth tissues. And so what they get is they get these aborted leaders and end up with these what they call hedging in these radiata pine plantations where they, where they uh, end up with, instead of a nice single leader, they end up with these, these almost dwarf looking hedge, hedge plants and they've, they've tracked this back to a, a problem with lack of boron in those, in those again, they're sandy soils, very, very low uh, boron. Um, <clears throat> fixing boron deficiency is fairly simple. Um, rates are usually low, maybe a pound per acre, uh, something like borax. Um, so it's typically not a, a, a major fertilization issue if you do have to add that. But again, be careful if you, if you do get a recommendation for boron and, and uh, you know, make sure you calibrate your spreader and all that before you, before you start putting that out on your, on your crop. Uh, Copper is not something I've uh, widely seen an issue with. Um, it's another one of these things that does show up in certain parts of the world. Another example here from a, a plantation, I think either in Australia or New Zealand with radiata pine. <coughs> And what they're showing here is copper is actually involved in some of the lignification, so making the stems harden off, and so they get these sort of uh, dipsy doodle type of shoots that are going on with their with their plants. And as you add enough uh, <laughs> copper, again, you're only talking about a few parts per million in the tissue, and we typically don't don't see an issue with that. Another commonly cited symptom with uh, copper deficiency is this twisting. In, uh, in needles, okay, and this is in white, white spruce. Part of this may be actual deficiency. There's also some thought that other elements, particularly phosphorus, might be uh, inhibiting copper uptake, so maybe one, one of these situations where one is, is interfering with the other. We mentioned that nickel has recently been identified as an essential element. We said that, you know, I said when I was in college, I learned there was 16, now there's 17, and one of the ones you added is, is nickel. It may not be necessary for everything, but one thing we do see is um, a deficiency that can sometimes occur in river birch. <coughs> and John Ruder at the University of Georgia did the work on this, and he was actually able to show that if you have these river birch that are showing this mouse ear uh, symptom, so we can pick this up. The, what happens is you have river birch, they develop really small leaves, and the leaves are kind of crinkled up. Sometimes it's called mouse ear or squirrel's ear, something like that. And uh, he was actually shown that you can, you can correct this with application of uh, nickel sulfate. Okay. And so he's, he's done the work on this. And so if you do run into the situation, uh, there's actually some recommendations out there now that you can follow that'll help alleviate that particular, particular uh, issue. Molybdenum, I don't think I've ever seen a molybdenum deficiency. It's one of these things that it'll show up. You'll see some things about agronomic crops. It's mostly important for uh, plants that are nitrogen fixers. Uh, molybdenum is needed for nitrogen fixation. Um, this is the typical symptom that's shown for agronomic crops. I don't know that I've ever seen it. I haven't seen any reports of it in any, in any woody crops. Um, similarly with zinc, um, something that that I don't think I've ever seen a report on in, in, uh, in woody plants, but it's, it's out there. Uh, occasionally, we can run into things where, you know, we say that there are 17 essential elements, but actually, if you do an analysis on plant tissue, 
Plants will take up about 30, 35 different elements from the soil. Okay, lots of things that they don't need, um, selenium, lead, cadmium, you know, heavy metals, but they'll also take up aluminum. And we can run into situations around here where if we have our, our pH is too low, we can run into problems with aluminum toxicity because aluminum availability increases as pH goes down. And if you get your soils too acidic, you can actually have problems with, uh, with pH. This was uh, a nursery out here in West Michigan. These are some ewes. And in this case, uh, what's going on is uh, the pH is basically going down across the field. You can look across and you can see the plants sort of getting smaller, smaller, sparser and sparser. And so basically, or as you go from left to right here on, this, on these uh, plant photos, the the pH was going down and down, and the, P and the aluminum concentration, we ran some tissue samples, and the aluminum concentration was going up and up. So you have to be careful not to get them, get them too low. Uh, you can run into two issues that way. Um, I think I'm going to just wrap up real quick here and go through the last few, few slides here. And a lot of this is just sort of, sort of reiterating a few things you've already talked about. But as you're thinking about uh, managing uh, nutrition, Things you want to make sure you know about your sites is understand your soil texture, what's your textural class, uh, and also if you can know your CEC okay, because that's going to influence uh, how you manage, especially some of these things like potassium and some of the other cations. pH, okay, are you five, are you seven, where are you at? And the more you know about that, the more, more you can manage either to get the pH in the right range or perhaps plant things that are more appropriate for that particular site. Okay, the pH is going to tend to, you know, you can add sulfur and you can drop pH, but it's going to tend to come back up, all right, over time. So maybe you're better off planting something that's more tolerant of the pH that's already there. Soil testing um, certainly should be a regular part of your program. Pre-plant, because a lot of these things, if you're going to adjust pH, if you're going to lime, okay, it's easiest to do that pre-plant. If you're going to add phosphorus, for example, it's easiest to do pre-plant. And then develop a program where you're regularly monitoring so that you can uh, adjust on the fly if, as you need to. Okay, texture triangle, you've all had that. And just be aware of your uh, CEC. When we get into some of these, and we have soils like this in Michigan, you see that three to five CEC, we can run into those kind of situations. Again, some of you folks are over there right next to the lake shore, and that's you know, not much there to hold on to our nutrients, and so you're almost into a soilless kind of, of culture. And so some of these micronutrients and things you might not typically think of, you know, can come into, into play, so be aware of that. Um, this is just to show some, some reference values there. If you are into a situation where you need to adjust pH one way or the other, I'll, it's in your handout, so you've got that as a, as a reference. I won't go into details there, but basically, the more of a shift you need to make, the more material you need to add, the uh, Finer texture soil, the more material you need to add, either to raise or lower pH. I think most of you could, could figure that out. And then um, <clears throat> we can use elemental sulfur. You might be able to use uh, ammonium sulfate if you need to lower your pH, for example. And this just gives you the, the ratios there of, of how much ammonium sulfate you would need to get the same acidifying uh, effect as using elemental, elemental sulfur. So. Um, <clears throat> things with container production, um, biggest thing is, you know, the plants are dependent on you to give them the nutrients. So the, the fertilizer program has to account for all of those elements. You need to pay attention to the EC. Tom Fernandez is our container guru, so you've, you've probably seen his presentations. But, um, you know, watch the EC of your uh, solution. Do the pour-through test to see... Uh, for a couple of reasons. One is if you're over fertilizing, you run into injuries, uh, run into problems with salt injury, you know, osmotic stress. Uh, the other thing is if you're using a controlled release product, for example, doing EC tests might give you some clues when your material is starting to, starting to wear out. Okay, do you need to top dress again with a little bit to get you through the end of the, end of the season? Uh, just a quick bit here on uh, over-fertilization. Um, we said that, you know, the dose makes the poison. For most of the macros, we typically don't have uh, issues with, uh, you know, direct toxicity and over-fertilization. 
probably the biggest issue we would have would be uh, some salt injury. Again, using something like KCL, uh, if, you're, if you're a little, uh, you know, you have a, a miscalibrated spreader or something like that, or drop spreader where you're getting, you know, banding or something like that, you can run into some salt injury with something like KCL. Uh, boron is probably the biggest one that you need to be careful of in terms of, of a direct toxicity. Probably a bigger area for concern and why we want to try to optimize our nutrient management is uh, environmental concerns. So we know that uh, nitrate, for example, can be an issue with groundwater. See if you have too much nitrate leaching through your system that can get to groundwater. And then, of course, the bigger issue these days is eutrophic eutrophication. And that's primarily a function of getting nitrogen and phosphorus into surface waters. Okay? And then we have these algal blooms and all that goes along with that. And then we end up with situations like they had in Toledo last year. And of course, a lot of finger pointing at agriculture as well as uh, wastewater and so forth. Um, the more we can do to optimize our nutrition, certainly if it's, if it's getting in our plants where we want it, uh, that's what we want to do. It's not benefiting anybody if the stuff is, is leaving our site, if it's fertilizer you've played, paid for, it's not getting into your plants. Uh, and that's certainly not, not helping. Uh, you have now completed the webinar, The Missing Element, Plant Nutrition and Fertilization Beyond Nitrogen. Now, please click or type in the link below to complete a brief exit survey. By taking this exit survey, you are helping us collect essential data required by federal agencies. Thank you very much.